Thank you very much, uh, Salmale, and good day to so many friends uh, and comrades uh, who are today here in this webinar to celebrate uh, 25 years of, of food sovereignty um, and agrarian reform. I think it is really uh, a very important moment to, to, to look back and see what our movement uh, has achieved. And I think I've been asked to talk about uh, the right to land uh, and territory, and I think I would say that the major achievement in the past 25 years is that um, as food sovereignty movement, we have managed to have a vision on how, do, on how we think uh, land and territories should be governed for, for, for all the things that Shalmali address, for, for the well-being of our communities for gender justice, for climate justice. And I think um, it has been Maria. a remarkable... Yes? Okay. Uh, I continue, I think. Um, and I think perhaps the most salient and tangible um, uh, signal or, or manifestation expression of this achievement has been the recognition of the right to land and territory in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas. 25 years ago, we didn't have that, uh, at least recognized by the UN uh, in, in an international human rights instrument. Now we have it, and it is very clear that it was this recognition was due to the strong mobilization uh, and aspiration of many people and communities on the ground. Um, and I think the Article 17 in this declaration outlines uh, what, um, again, the aspirations of many grassroots communities are about a relationship to their lands and territories, rivers, um, coastal areas, which really protects this relationship as communities, as a collective right. Um, and therefore, I think it is very, very important uh, to highlight this. And uh, the other aspect is um, the issue of, of, as part of that right, for all the landless communities, uh, the right to have agrarian reform. Uh, for women uh, we, who don't have uh, access to land on their own right, for the youth, uh, this is spelled out in Article 17, and I think um, it is very important because the increasing land concentration in the world calls us today for revitalizing our struggle for agrarian reform, for an agroecological agrarian reform, a people's genuine and comprehensive agrarian reform, as, as MST uh, calls it in Brazil. So, um, therefore, I think uh, that um, this Article 17 of the Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas um, supports struggles on the ground, gives them um, uh, legal leverage to face uh, the right to private property, uh, which you know that it is prevalent in the way land is governed. Uh, it is very important also for turning land into a commodity, which is what we are seeing, uh, and it is right, uh, it is um, becoming really uh, very widespread. And it is very important to commodify and financialize land and nature. So therefore, um, the right to land, as it was uh, enshrined in the Declaration on the Rights of Peasants, opposes the idea that land is a private property and it is a commodity, uh, which is, as you know, um, has become a financial asset um, uh, for, for the um, global um, financial uh, markets. So it also uh, challenges the idea of uh, uh, state eminent domain, which you, many of you know, this is another legal um, tool which states use to dispossess people, to take away their lands, their forests in many countries. And the right to land opposes that view and challenges that view and gives leverage uh, to the grassroots struggles uh, to uh, oppose that uh, development. Um, so therefore, um, I think, um, well, this is the main aspect I wanted to highlight. I think 
that uh, the massive crisis that we are seeing, also a crisis of democracy and states, as, as Charles Mali was uh, pointing to, um, uh, it, is, it would be naive to expect our states to comply with all these obligations. Of course, we will continue demanding them, but I think the most important aspect I wanted to highlight today is the vision that it is contained in the declaration, in, the, in Article 17 of that declaration, so that our communities and our capacity of self-governance is guided by this vision. So we have to take these rights on our hands and we have um, to uh, put them in practice and implement that vision of justice and human dignity that it is contained in Article 17. Thank you very much. Compañeras y compañeros del Movimiento Social Internacional, Club Vía Campesina. Club que es la coordinadora latinoamericana de organizaciones del campo con sede en la región de América Latina. En esta ocasión queremos saludar el esfuerzo que hacen los compañeros de Asia con el tema de la reforma agraria. Para nosotros hay un largo camino alrededor del tema de la reforma agraria. Y en la última etapa nos referimos al encuentro en el 2012 de Bukitingi en Indonesia hacia Marabá eh, en el 20 año de la masacre del Dorado de Carayas que se presentó en 1996 allá en, en la Amazonía brasileña, donde fueron asesinados muchos compañeros del MST, Movimiento Sin Tierra, por luchar por la reforma agraria. En este camino logramos entonces nosotros darle un enfoque más amplio al tema de la reforma agraria. Y en este sentido, trabajar el tema de la tierra, el agua y el territorio. La reforma agraria, como ustedes pueden saber, tiene muchas, muchas formas de entenderla dependiendo de las características de cada país. Sin embargo, en el tema de la tierra, lo fundamental es tener el pleno acceso a la tierra, promover la soberanía alimentaria y cultivar mediante la agroecología. Nosotros desde esta región hemos promovido el concepto de reforma agraria popular e integral, que amplía el concepto que teníamos antes, que era muy clásico, en una distribución normal de la tierra, algo de mayor profundidad, que trata de resolver el problema del hambre en el mundo y logra eh, garantizar que las familias campesinas puedan producir la tierra. En el tema de la reforma agraria integral y popular, eh, lo tenemos como tarea central y fue la columna vertebral en el nacimiento de la vía campesina allá en 1992 cuando surge esta idea en Managua, Nicaragua en el mes de abril. Hoy, ya cerca de los 30 años, hay todo mucho que decir en el tema de la tierra, en el tema del acceso, en el, en el tema de que solo si los productores y productoras, campesinas y campesinos pueden producir la tierra y producir alimentos, van a ir saliendo de la pobreza y de la crisis que tenemos en estos, en estos años. Además, el tema de la tierra es bien complejo, porque en muchos países se está presentando el extractivismo, la, los megaproyectos, eh, los grandes embalses de agua para la producción, producir energía, y que esto crea dificultades, como también lo es la minería a cielo abierto, que al final van eh, quebrando la naturaleza y destruyéndola. Hay una antigua eh, expresión que decía eh, uno de los grandes biólogos de la teoría política, Carlos Marx, que decía que el capitalismo destruía dos elementos fundamentales, al ser humano y también a la naturaleza. Y eso es lo que nosotros podemos ver en, esta, en estas condiciones. Por eso nosotros creemos de que el tema de la reforma agraria es fundamental. Hay muchos elementos. Hemos trabajado las directrices para la gobernanza de la tierra, estamos trabajando la unidad 
de los centros populares, pero sobre todo por, por volver a colocar en el tema de, eh, del movimiento social y en este caso de la vía campesina y nuestros aliados, la reforma agraria como la piedra principal, angular y principal para poder salir de la pobreza y de esta manera mejorar las condiciones de vida en el campo. Viva el encuentro de la reforma agraria que hacen los compañeros de Asia. Muchas gracias. Uh, pagi selamat sore Hello. good afternoon everyone long life kisan viva la via campesina ya yeah. uh, hari ini adalah okay. is an important day for us untuk mendiskusikan To discuss good morning from Indonesia, Fifa Campesina. This is a good day in the context to discuss of food about agrarian reform in context of food sovereignty. Because I, I see that several As speakers, I see there's for example, there, our moderator, the moderator there, so Mali, Sofia, they have presented. And all the audience have been familiar with the problems in Indonesia. Ramesh also discussed about Indonesian problems. I'm going to give you three or four points. First, agrarian reform in Indonesia has not been implemented by the government. The government just, sorry, the farmer just do the efforts from the transition from the Dutch colonial to the Japanese colonial, millions of lands controlled by the colonial can be controlled now by the peasants. Those land were used for food crops. Then when Indonesia got its independence in 1945 until 1965, though the President Sukarno issued regulations on agrarian reform, agrarian law, but the government could not implement agrarian reform. They could not implement it because they implemented as uh, with low basic. Moreover, the next government, President Suharto, who was really capitalism, he defined agrarian reform as distributing land using contract farming with transmigration program and land grabbing massively happened for planting mining and many more then the question is when do we recl uh, successfully recline The answer is in 1998 until 2002 under the government of President Husdur and President Habibi in the transition power from the authoritarian power to democracy. From 2002 until today, the, the government have issued protections for uh, peasants laws for protection laws or support UN drop and also the government of President Jokowi who distributed land, millions of land through Reforma Agraria and also solutions for Reforma Agrarian problems. But in fact, there was no significant solutions for the peasant. For offer, Hessen's land was scraped and the law of omnibus law 
new creations of uh, labor becomes complicated. My question is, it seems that reforma agraria it seems that the government want to support agrarian reform. If not, they they don't. This is what I see. And I also remember what Peter said that many lands of MST was occupied during the Cardoso regime than in Lula regime. So the question is, did agrarian reform succeed in Venezuela under the government of Maduro? And also this happening in other countries such as in Bolivia. Or maybe I can ask the questions to promise. Does the new government switching from the Democrat from the uh, monarchy to the democracy successfully implement the agrarian reform and also in Africa what happened in Zimbabwe for example about distributing land to the present so Agrarian reform can be successfully implemented if the government really support this program and support with the quick process without laws because corporates they will hide behind the democracy under the law. And the last point, you end or other government policy that is good for agrarian reform can be successful if the government really support the agrarian reform. If the government does not really have power or does not really support, so agrarian reform will not succeed. Agrarian reform received very strong attack. For example, we propose good laws, then tomorrow it will be delayed or cancelled, so our struggle will be weak. And this is our struggle. So then our struggle can be strong to strengthen the reform, agrarian reform and also our politics so that the government, so that the power will implement, fully implement agrarian reform. That's all what I want to explain in this discussion. And I want to say that agrarian reform will successfully implement food sovereignty, like what happened in several countries who have solved the problems of food. Thank you very much to all comrades who have all the meeting, FIFA La Via Campesina. I lost my internet momentarily. The world has changed, so social movement struggle has changed. And uh, that's, that's one of the things that we want to take into account in this, this historical portion of this seminar today. So 
If we take our meeting in Maraba a few years ago, mentioned by Shalmali and by Fausto, we can say that very clearly in the current historical conjuncture, social movement struggle is very, very clearly in opposition to land grabbing, land privatization, large scale monoculture plantations, otherwise known as green deserts, counter agrarian reform. Many countries in the world are trying to reverse previous agrarian reforms the creating of land markets and fake agrarian reform, fake partnerships such as fake partnerships between corporations and peasants, fake solutions to climate change like we're about to hear about at COP26 in Glasgow, like agrofuels and other kinds of greenwashing. And very clearly, we are engaged in and in favor of struggles that offend land and territory from encroachment by land grabbers, mega development projects, capitalist enterprises, and we are for genuine, comprehensive, popular, or people's agrarian reform as part of building food sovereignty, as Fausto said. And uh, one thing that we can see very clearly is the dispute between plantation-style corporate agriculture, uh, feeding commodity markets as opposed to feeding people, versus peasant agroecology based on peasant seeds as the model that Many social movements like La Via Campesina and others struggle in favor of, try to construct and defend. Uh, some of the key uh, points that we debate these days or positions that, uh, positions that we support are in favor of popular or people's agrarian reform, where agrarian reform is not just a fight between peasants and land grabbers, rather it's an issue for all of society. Uh, and that agrarian reform in the countryside benefits urban people. This is an argument that we are making. It's also a reality. And this is part of defending, uh, in terms of public opinion, the need for agrarian reform in today's world. When we see the COVID pandemic and how unhealthy corporate food is a comorbidity factor through diabetes and obesity uh, with COVID, we see the importance of healthy food when when uh, agribusiness commodity chains break down because of long distance transport during lockdowns, we see that local peasant agriculture feeds people. We see that it conserves the environment, that it keeps water clean, conserves traditions of village life and culture. And these are all elements of a popular people's agrarian reform that we defend today, particularly in the current crisis, health, economic, social environmental crisis and climate crisis that we're facing in the world today. So we are talking about comprehensive agrarian reform based on peasant organizations, real cooperatives and peasant agroecology. And we're talking about building a political alliance between peasants and the, in the countryside and peasants in the city. By peasants in the city, I'm referring to the population of the urban periphery of shanty towns, favelas, uh, poor neighborhoods, popular neighborhoods, who essentially are the sons and daughters of peasants who migrated to the city or peasants who migrated or the grandchildren of peasants who migrated who are expelled from the countryside but are who are still part of that larger global peasant family. And if Peter, we talk Peter, about Peter, the Peter peasants, please speak a bit so slowly for the yes. interpretation, please. We Thank talk you. about peasants who are still in the countryside. That's almost one half of the world's population. And the peasants who have and their offspring who have migrated to the city, that's about another 30% of the world's population. Then we're talking about a potential political alliance in favor of agrarian reform that might be as much as 75 or 80% of all of humanity. So this is something we're seeing very clearly now as an argument for agrarian reform is building this political alliance between peasants and indigenous people who are in rural areas and the large greater peasant family that we find in the city as well. Some of the other elements uh, that I'd like to address in the, in the last few minutes that I have of the current conjuncture, the current situation of the struggle for agrarian reform and the defense of land and territory are, for example, the, uh, the ever greater presence of peasant women and peasant youth in the forefront of struggle, defending land and territory, 
at the barricades when police and private security try to evict land occupations and building agroecology processes to turn peasant territories into peasant agroecological territories with healthy food uh, uh, for humanity and taking care of Mother Earth. Another change that we've seen over recent years has, has been how the struggle has evolved from a struggle just for land to a struggle for territory. Territory being much more than just land as something to work and something to farm, which of course it is, but territory also being where rural culture resides, where ancestors reside, where spirituality is, where water, mountains, land, forests, uh, animate and inanimate life forms reside in territory. And territory also is the place where different rural peoples coexist, whether indigenous people, nomadic pastoralists, fisher folk, peasants, the landless, farm workers. And so we all have to struggle together to defend our territories from mining concessions, from plantation agriculture, from corporate land grabbing. Another thing that is currently on the forefront of debate in social movements, in which Von Henry mentioned, has been the need to rethink our relationships between movements, electoral parties, and the state or governments. Because as he very well expressed it, even our more friendly or progressive governments have not had an excellent record in terms of delivering on agrarian reform and building food sovereignty. Sometimes, in some rare cases, we've seen advances, but more often than not, uh, we've been disappointed in, in, in what's actually taken place, even when our so-called friends are in government. And so this is not, there's not a clear position in social movements about it, but I think there's clarity that this is something that we need to rethink. And then finally, and related to this, is we've seen how the focus has shifted from pretty much exclusively on making demands from the state to taking land reform into our own hands, land reform from, be from below through land occupations. And more recently, we have a growing debate on territorial autonomies. If the state doesn't deliver, if as as Henry said, we pass good laws and then they don't implement them or they reverse them. If they don't implement policies that are favorable to peasant agriculture, then perhaps in the territories that we control, we should be thinking about different kinds of autonomous ways to organize village life, territorial life, production, education, and everything else that goes on uh, and, and in terms of making positive livelihoods for people and taking care of Mother Earth in rural areas. So as we say in Chiapas, Mexico, autonomy is something that must be cultivated. And if we can't rely on the state, then there's this growing question of, are there partial or relative kinds of autonomies that we can construct in our territories? So just in the 10 minutes that I had, those are a few of the ways in which social movements have evolved in terms of agrarian reform and the defense of land and territory. And I close then with the Via Campesina slogan, globalized struggle, globalized hope. Thank you very much.